Well, hello, everyone. How are you doing this evening? Excellent. Doing well. It's a beautiful, sunny evening. And speaking of the sun, who's excited for the eclipse? Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Melody Lutz, and I am the Education and Programming Manager here at the library. And I am delighted to welcome you to What If the Sun Doesn't Come Back, uh, presented by Dr. Philip J. Sakimoto from the University of Notre Dame. A couple of quick announcements before we get started tonight. Should you need to leave for any reason, there are emergency exits in the back of the auditorium. You can exit on either the left or the right. And you will also find our restrooms down the hallway. Even more exciting is that we will be giving away eclipse glasses here at the library on the day of the eclipse and tonight. So please see me afterwards if you would like a pair. All right, without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Sakimoto. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, everyone. Glad you're all here. Uh, we're really lucky to have an eclipse coming nearby, actually for the second time in, what, seven years or something like that. So this is great. So I want to talk to you about what to expect and first thing, of course, is just remind you that a solar eclipse happens when the moon passes in front of the sun, right? And so it blocks the sunlight from reaching just a little spot on the Earth, and our goal is to get ourselves to that spot, right? Okay. Um, my story tonight begins a lot of years ago in 1977, October of 1977, I was a graduate student then in astronomy at UCLA, and there was a total solar eclipse coming. It was going to be best viewed from somewhere out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So the Astronomical Society of the Pacific chartered two Sitmar cruise liners and sold all the seats to astronomers, professional astronomers and amateur astronomers, and uh, we got on board the boats and headed out towards the eclipse. Now, I'm not sure I want to show you this, but I will. So this is me. <laughs> it's 1977, OK? And um, th this was hard duty. I mean, you know, we kept getting interrupted by deck stewards offering us drinks. <laughs> Um, and in the other side of the photo is my, on, the, on your right is my buddy Steve Edberg, uh, who uh, later on became a professional eclipse chaser and uh, the leader of expeditions to see total solar eclipses. Now, Steve, as you can see, just wanted to get good photos. He brought, made and brought this ridiculous array. I'm sorry, I shouldn't call it ridiculous. I thought it was kind of ridiculous. Various telescopes and cameras with lenses of different lengths and whatnot. And I told him, and I will tell you, I did not want to take any photos during the eclipse. Okay? You're going through a lot of effort. It's going to be four minutes of your life. You don't want to waste those four minutes fooling with the camera because if you fumble it or something goes wrong, you're looking down at it, you've just missed the whole thing. So I told Steve, okay. I will help you get all this gear out there. I'll help you set it up. I will help you calibrate it. But when the time comes, you're on your own. That's what we did. He got some pretty nice pictures. But I saw the eclipse. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is where we were. Uh, that's one of the Sitmar liners. Shipmar liners. The, uh, they told us that, well, the bartenders are really upset at this whole thing. Because they said no one came down to buy drinks in the evening. Everyone was up on deck looking at the stars. So it's, they said, they said they, you know, set a record for the least amount of drink sales on board a cruise. But this map shows you where we were. We were down, uh, down about here in the South Pacific, waiting for the eclipse to start. Now, the night before the eclipse would happen, you know, the ship had just, uh, you know, was just just uh, idling, you know, in the place we wanted to be watching. In the dead of the night, I suddenly felt the ship lurch. And I heard the engines roaring. And I found out in the morning that what happened is that the leader's expedition had concluded that where we were, it was going to be cloudy. 
but there was a clear spot a couple hundred miles away. And the captain agreed to go there, so he literally floored it around midnight <laughs> and got us there. You know, in plenty of time for the eclipse. I didn't know you could do that with a cruise ship, but you did. Now, when we look at the eclipse starting, uh, it's important to think about what we're looking at here. You see the moon starting to cross, come across the sun. It comes across from the right, right? Because what's happening here is that while normally you see, from your vantage point, you see the sun and the stars and they go across the sky this way, right, every day. But the thing that causes the eclipse is that the moon is moving in its orbit around the Earth. And its orbital motion is that way. So the moon comes across the sun from the right side. Okay? And depending on the, the way the moon's orbit is tipped at that time, it might come down uh, as it did in this eclipse in 77 from the right and a little from above. This time, I think it's going to come in a little bit from below because of the way it's tipped right now. But anyway, you'll see it coming from the right. Now, what you're looking at here is the part of the sun that we call the photosphere, uh, what we perceive as the surface of the sun. But of course, the sun has no real surface, right? It's just a big ball of gas. Um, and uh, at, at this part that you see, it's just sort of, I want to say, farther out, if you were to look at it, it looks kind of transparent so you can see deeper in. And what you see as a photosphere is based on the limit of how deep you can see into it. There, the temperature is about 6,000 degrees Kelvin, which is what, I don't know, 10,000 Fahrenheit or something like that, uh, which is pretty hot. Um, and if you keep going farther down in what we call the solar atmosphere, it gets hotter and hotter to get right down to the surface. So, but, so what you see is the photosphere. Now, the sun during the eclipse is just as bright as the sun not during an eclipse. And you know that you're not supposed to look at the sun. So you have to protect your eyes by wearing eclipse glasses. And yes, I have brought some here. Here they are on a pack. These are official Notre Dame eclipse glasses. We made them. Yeah, 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 yeah. We sprung from making thousands of these. So, so you at least get one when we're through here. Um, I have to tell you that there is an issue with eclipse glass. I'm sorry to have to bring this up. I don't want to. But some of my friends in the American Astronomical Society, which is the, um, the major organization of professional astronomers for the country, have put together an eclipse task force. They've been all aspects of this thing. They've been watching very carefully the eclipse glasses that are being sold. Okay. Anything that was manufactured that's on the market before March 11th is probably quite safe. But beginning on March 11th, they began to see a lot of counterfeit glasses flooding the market. This happened last time, too. So there are some bad actors who are trying to make money out of people panicking at the last minute and trying to get glasses. Yeah, I see some of you getting your phones out. That's the right thing to do. So on, the le uh, on your left over there, that QR code takes you to the AAS's complete explanation of this whole business of counterfeit glasses and all that. And on the right is a list of actually links to approved vendors because uh, the AAS has been looking at and testing all the glasses out there. The bottom line is this. If you got your glasses before March 11th, or, or whoever you got them from got them before March 11th, don't worry about it. They're good. After that, or if you still need to buy some, well, don't. We're going to give you some. But if anyone needs to buy some, you're advised not to go on Amazon or any general online site and pick whatever you want, because that's where the counterfeits are. If you have some you're not sure, how do you check? I'm going to tell you how you check. You're going to get your glasses, and you're just going to put them on and look around. Okay. Now, if you can see anything at all, if you see enough to walk around, throw them away. They're counterfeit. A good eclipse glass is not like a sunglass. You should not be able to see through it at all for ordinary things. All right. You might touch very faint, the very brightest lights. If I look at this, oh, these are good. I can't even see the lights over there or the light coming through the shades. 
So, well, just faintly, I can see the light coming through the shades. So that's how it should look to you. When you go outside, first just glance at the sun with them. The sun should be very comfortably dim. I think of it like, like uh, as dim as a distant taillight at night. I mean, really, no problem at all for your eyes. And, uh, and then the other thing you do is just look at them carefully, make sure there's no holes or scratches in it. And if not, then they're probably good, okay? Um, and unfortunately, I have to say that although properly made sunglasses will carry a fine print requirement saying they meet their transmission requirements, ISO 12312-2, don't believe it, because the counterfeiters are just putting that out of their glasses, whether or not they've actually been tested. And if you see glasses that claim that they have been approved by NASA or tested by NASA, don't believe that. Because NASA is not testing them. Okay. Um, we're actually not allowed to. It's NASA. I say we because I used to work for NASA. I spent a decade and a half working for NASA before in NASA's space science education program. And as a public agency, okay, a government agency is not allowed to endorse any commercial vendor. Okay, so we couldn't get in the business of sorting them. But the AAS is a private nonprofit. They're the ones who've done it. So check it out with them. Um, what else do I have to say? It, you don't need a pair of glasses for everyone in your party because eclipses evolve slowly and there's plenty of time to pass around and share. Uh, and then to be triply safe, you know, don't just put these on and stare at the sun for hours. That's no. You put them on, you look at it for a few seconds or five seconds or 10 seconds, and then you look away and then you look back and, you know, just be safe with them. Um, if you are planning to try and take photos or trying to look with binoculars, cameras, telescopes, anything like that, first of all, again, I don't recommend it because you don't need that. This is a naked eye event. But if you're using any other, any other optical device other than your own eyeglasses, don't. <laughs> okay, these filters are not designed for use with a camera or binoculars or anything because the camera or binocular right, magnifies and intensifies the light. And these are not strong enough to handle that. You have to bought from a reptile dealer uh, filters that are designed to put on the front of your camera, not behind the eyepiece, on the front, okay? And uh, that's that, but like I said, better just be ready to go see with naked eye. Okay, let's get back to our eclipse. So it takes an hour or so uh, for the partial phase to happen. It's a very slow thing. But while it's coming, or even before the eclipse, when you have your glasses, you might look at the sun really carefully, and you might see sunspots. So here, these little dots are sunspots, first observed by Galileo back around 1600 or so. Um, you can, the biggest ones you can see with your, not your naked eye, but with your naked eye just through these glasses. If you look closely, your vision's good. Uh, they are actually pretty big. A typical sunspot is about the same size as the Earth. Now, the Earth is 8,000 miles across in diameter. The sun is 109 times bigger than that. So the Earth looks like one of those little dots on the surface of the sun. It gives you an idea of the scale of the sun. If you tried to cram Earths inside the sun, you could fit about a million of them in there. That's how big the sun is. What are the sunspots? They are places of very strong magnetic fields actually. And what happens is that where the sun's about, so that magnetic field takes up some of the energy that would normally go into heat. So at the place of sunspots, it's a little bit cooler, not a lot cooler, but a little bit cooler, which is why it looks dark where the sunspots are. So there they are. So you can see magnetic storms on the sun. And if you watch the sun for you know, come back if you see sunspots on it. You really might. There's a huge solar flare, flare yesterday. So I think there may be nice sunspots. I want, it's more as cloudy in look, and I didn't think look just now before I came in, but you may be able to see them even, even now. Uh, if you see any sunspots, you know, come back, look the next day, the next day, the next day. You know, and if you're paying attention, you'll see that these spots are actually moving because the sun rotates just like the Earth rotates. You know, the Earth spins around. The sun does too. But the sun is a ball of gas, right? It's not solid. So 
crazily, the sort of middle of the equator of the sun goes around faster than the poles do. So it takes about 25 days for the middle of the sun to go around once and oh, something like 30, 36, I think, days to go around at the poles. So the sun is constantly, constantly kind of winding itself up like this. And that's actually what strengthens the magnetic fields inside the sun and causes them to pop out from time to time in the sunspots. So it's fun to watch. Now, as we're getting closer to totality, and I hope you go to totality, more on that in a minute, um, you know, you're getting excited and anxious, and there's fun things you can do. If you can find something that lets a little bit of sunlight through, like this straw hat that you see there, now, if you look at the light coming through the straw hat, you'll see that every spot of sunlight is a little crescent, okay? Because those little holes between the straw act like a pinhole camera, and they project an image of the eclipsed sun. And you can play games. In fact, if there are young ones, or there are a few, you know, at this point, look around for other things that can project little crescent images of the sun. Uh, this is great. Uh, I intend to bring, uh, grab a, a colander from my kitchen and bring it. I think that will be really fun. Or even just holding up your fingers, make a little hole like this, hold it out. The sunlight project down will make a little crescent. It's really kind of fun. Uh, I've seen it in like light filtering through tree leaves and all kinds of things. Okay. Now we're getting really, really close. Still have to keep your eclipse glasses on when you're looking at the sun, but Three minutes before totality at your place, and I'll tell you how to pre predict that precisely in a minute, you might want to tear your eyes away from the sun and look towards the west because the shadow of the moon will be coming. Now, this was a satellite photo taken at the time of the eclipse out at sea, and that arrow's pointing, you see kind of a, a, a dark blob here? That's the shadow of the moon on the earth. Okay, and so we're down here, and that shadow is coming this way. And so if you look to the west, you might see that shadow coming. It will be a huge dark curtain on the sky. Uh, and it comes at you really, really, really fast. And as soon as you see it, you go, oh my gosh, there it is. And the next thing you know, it's going to envelop you. You'll be inside, and Totel will be starting. But still keep your glasses on. And watch for the diamond ring effect. Okay, um, What this is, is that, remember, the moon is not, as they thought before Galileo, a perfectly smooth ball, right? We know now it's got mountains and craters and valleys. And so often, just as the moon is almost covering the whole sun, you'll see light coming through like a deep valley on the edge of the moon creates this effect that has been called the diamond ring, where you get a really bright spot. That bright spot will still hurt your eyes, so you've got to keep your glasses on at this point. And then, glasses still on, maybe you'll see Bailey's beads, because sometimes, as that diamond sort of goes away and the moon is covering you more of the sun, you might see light peering through just you know, a number of smaller valleys, making it look like there's little beads along the sun Sort of like beads on a necklace. That's why they're called Bailey's bead. I'm sorry, I, I don't know who Bailey is, but you know, it was alliterative, so it works, right? Once all of those beads are gone and you no longer see any of these bright spots, then you can take your glasses off. And when you look again, it's going to be amazing. These photos, by the way, we're not taken by me. Some were taken by my buddy Steve. Some were taken by the ship's photographer. I said, let the professionals do it. I'm just going to watch. But what you see here now is, OK, the dark is now, this is now the moon blocking the view. And if you look right around the edge, you see a little red peeking through there. The red is the chromosphere. It's the next layer outward in the sun, outside the photosphere. It's hotter than the photosphere. And the red is caused by hydrogen atoms in there. For the technical client among you, is that the hydrogen atoms are constantly getting excited, atoms are constantly getting excited or maybe ionized when the electrons come back and they cascade down to the energy levels. There's one jump there that's at the right energy to make that red color um, 
at uh, 65, 63 angstroms. That's what makes the chromosphere. We call it chromosphere, it's colored, right? It's red. And you can never see it normally when you look at the sun, but during an eclipse is the only time we can see it. So watch for the chromosphere and look really carefully at it because you might get lucky. <coughs> and given that the sun is being very accurate right now, I think there's a good chance of getting lucky. And you might even see solar flares. So solar flares are ejections of this hot plasma uh, caused by those magnetic fields in the sunspots. Uh, and they shoot jets of, of this hot gas of plasma out for like maybe 100,000 100, miles or more. And they're really large. And um, that's big enough that you can see them as little, they look like little fingers of fire um, right along the sun in the red there. So watch carefully for that. Uh, the sun goes through cycles of times when it's quiet and times when it's very active. It takes about 11 years to make a full cycle, and we are within a year of the maximum activity of the sun. So right now is a good time to have an eclipse. There will be a lot, a lot of um, activity and hopefully flares to see. Farther out, it's white in the photo. It's almost more gossamer silver to your, to your eyes. It's the corona. The solar corona is the very tenuous, far outer atmosphere of the sun. It's really hot. It's like a million degrees out there. And extends much farther from the sun than you can see in this photo, because the camera really can't capture it, which is another reason to look with your own eyes. Um, this photo might give you a better sense of it. You look up there, all of that white is the corona. The moon is the little black dot in the middle of that. So it extends quite a ways out. Sometimes farther, sometimes not so far, depending on the eclipse. This one, I think, we're going to see a pretty big a corona because the sun is so active right now and because this is a pretty, as we call, deep, a lengthy eclipse. Um, Curiously, if you were out there inside the corona, and if you had something to shade you from the direct sunlight, even though the temperature is a million degrees, you would freeze to death. <laughs> because the gas in the corona is so thin that there's just not enough there to transfer heat to your body. And so, yeah, you can freeze to death in the million degree corona. Don't try it. <laughs> now, yeah, you're only going to have four minutes, but you've got to spend some of that time, again, taking your eyes away from the sun and look down to the horizon. And you might see what looks like a sunset 360 degrees around you. For this to happen, there have to be clouds down near the horizon. And in this eclipse, there were, and this is just a piece of it. So what's happening here is that although the moon is blocking the sun right where you are, of course, sunlight is going around the moon and coming down the ground you know, over there and over there, miles away. If there are clouds there, that sunlight reflect off the clouds and come back along the ground towards you. And because it's traversing a long length uh, through the atmosphere along the ground, it gets red, just like in a sunset. Uh, as the sunlight passes through the atmosphere, the air molecules scatter blue light out of the path. That's why the sky is blue, by the way. Um, and what's left over is the red, and that's what you see at sunset and this. So, yeah, this complete circle of sunset around you, amazing. Now, in this eclipse, it's going to get pretty dark, really dark. Uh, you might, well, you will certainly, if you're near the central line of the totality, you will probably, if you look again, um, if you were looking southward, the sun will be about up here, okay, uh, with the moon in front of it. You'll see Venus. Venus will be down here a bit. Jupiter will be up there. And you'll likely see some of the brighter stars. If you know the constellation for Orion, that'll be visible over there. And that's wild to see these stars. Proves they're really there even in the middle of the day. Um, yeah. And if you want to see more of that, I was just checking this out in our planetarium last night, so I knew. And I think my buddy Keith Davis is doing a number of public shows in our planetarium in Notre Dame, and he'll probably show this to you. I say probably because I don't know exactly what he's doing these shows. Um, what else? Uh, you need to listen during the eclipse. 
because a lot of birds and animals will think it's bedtime. Uh, it might get really quiet because the birds will go to sleep someplace. Uh, if you see any critters wandering around, they might just scurry off to their bedtime burrows. Uh, you never know, but the animals get very confused by this. Uh, I've heard stories recently of bees, for instance, suddenly just turning tail and scurrying back to the hive for the night. Because, uh, you know, they don't know. Okay, so I think you see what I'm getting to. Even though right here the eclipse is going to be something like 97%, that's nothing. I mean, yeah, you see a very thin crescent, but it'll still be pretty bright. It'll be bright enough for you, as I say, to read a newspaper standing outside. It'll be like, you know, like late twilight. The difference between even that 97% partial and being where it's total is literally night and day. So if you're the worst total, I say it's going to be dark. And the reason to go, that's not even all these things I'm telling you can see, it's because it does something to you inside. It's just a really moving, almost spiritual experience. There's something about seeing that sun that we rely on so much, and even if you don't think about it, you know it, just suddenly vanish. It's just amazing. It's worth going. Okay, so where to go and how you do that, even this late date. I highly recommend this app uh, called Totality, made by Big Kid Science. Um, okay, I'm biased. It's made by a friend of mine, Jeff Bennett, who has also worked in NASA science education with me. Um, uh, but it's a really nicely made app, and it's good for every clips from now until forever, actually. And once you start it, you'll get a map that looks like this that shows you the eclipse path. Okay, so here you see where it's going. It's going to cut across the U.S., through Mexico, up through Texas, and all the way on to Toronto and onward. Um, and then it allows you to you know, just you know, pinch with your fingers or whatever so you can home in on where you are. So let's do this. So here's a path near us. Uh, there's Fort Wayne. Here's South Bend. Uh, there's Cincinnati. There's Indy. And there's Bloomington. That's the path. Okay, the blue line is the central path. You get on the blue line, you're going to have the deepest, darkest, longest eclipse possible. You get anywhere in the shaded part, you will still see a total eclipse, but it will be not as long and not as dark and not as spectacular. So your goal is to get as close to that center line as possible. Um, a lot of people are recommending, well, go to Indianapolis or go to Bloomington. Uh, personally, I'm not going to do that because I think there's going to be ridiculous crowds down there. Um, um, this shows you uh, in South Bend, you know, in South Bend, you just... Uh, you know, click on the map, so to speak, put your finger on any point, it'll pop up this thing that tells you exactly the so-called circumstance, exactly how much you see. So it's here in South Bend, 97% partial eclipse uh, begins at, this is uh, 13, that's 1.53, just before 2 o'clock. Uh, the maximum is just after 3, and then it's all over an hour later from that. But my plan and I will share it with you on Bachelet, is to just go to the point on that blue line that happens to be closest to us, which comes out of me near this town of Wapakoneta. Wapakoneta. Um, and I found a state park campground there, so I'm taking my little camping trailer and just going to hang out there uh, because there will be issues if you go. Um, I'll get to in a second. But here uh, you see the eclipse is going to be almost four minutes long, which is really good. The length of an eclipse is different from one total eclipse to the next because, remember, the moon's orbit around the Earth is not a perfect circle. It's a little bit of an ellipse, and our orbit around the sun is a little bit of an ellipse. So sometimes the moon is closer or farther by a bit. The sun is closer or farther by a bit. So what you want is the sun to be as far as it can be and the moon to be as close as it can be, right? It makes a bigger shadow. Uh, if that happens, the maximum possible eclipse length is seven minutes. We're getting four, which is pretty darn good. Okay, I think the one in 2070 was like two minutes or something. Not nearly as good, and it didn't get really, really dark that time. This one, I'm looking forward to it. All right, here's the good news and the bad news. Here's the good news, just be prepared. Okay, there's going to be a lot of traffic. There's no getting around that. However, based on my experience last time, the last eclipse in 2017, I went down to Nashville where my brother has a condo. 
And then getting there was no problem, really. I mean, the traffic is heavy, but it wasn't jammed uh, because people are going to be coming at all different times to get there, right? Uh, but afterwards, it's going to be really heavy traffic. So you need to bring food, you bring water, you need to be sure you fill your gas tank before you stop to watch, that you have a full tank for leaving. Uh, you need to have a plan for restrooms. Okay. Uh, one of my colleagues in the astronomy department likes to say, well, look, it's simple. Just, just find a Walmart parking lot. You know, you have plenty of room to park, the bathrooms there. And I say, well, that's true. There'll probably be plenty of room to park. There'll also be plenty of cars. But can you imagine what the lines of the bathroom are going to be like? Um, so just have a plan. You can figure it out, right? <laughs> Um, that's why I'm taking my camping trailer, because has a bathroom on board. Uh, I expect that right after the eclipse, right, right after totality, even while the partial phases are still unwinding, there's going to be very, very heavy traffic. Okay. Now, different people are giving different suggestions out there. This is my personal hunch. Okay. It's the one I'm betting on. I don't guarantee anything. But I'm betting on the fact that at this point, I think most of the people are going to jump on the interstates. And there's an interstate that runs real near there because most people want to go home to one of the bigger cities, right, just statistically. This place, coming from over there in South Bend, over there someplace, I can get to on smaller roads. You know, like US 30 goes about there. Uh, and even if that's jammed, I can get off on farm roads and come back. So my plan is to just kind of avoid the major roads, because that's where the jams are going to be. Most people instinctively get on the freeway. I grew up in LA. I don't want to get on the freeway, <laughs> and I'm not going to. Um, and you know, if you have some place you can stay after the eclipse overnight, then the next day of traffic will be fine. But is it worth going? Yeah, it's worth going. It's really worth going. And the biggest reason, as I said before, it, it's what it gets to you in your gut, in the, the depths of your soul that cannot be described. But just about everyone that goes to see one comes back realizing that. So it's worth it. And, um, you know, if you decide it's just too much hassle and you want to wait till next time, well, you can do that. That'll be 2045. <laughs> um, there is a total solar eclipse. Usually about every year or two, someplace on the globe, but this is the next one that's going to pass over the continental U.S. And as you can see from this, it's not going to close to here. So, um, you know, rethink it. Think about going. And if you just really don't want to believe and insist that you're just going to stay home, well, okay. But if you do, at least turn into the NASA webcast of eclipses, it's something we started back when I was managing NASA education projects back in like the 90s. Um, send teams to sites where the eclipse is going to be total. For this one, I think they're going to have four teams scattered at four different spots across the United States. They do tremendously well done uh, webcasts of the eclipse starting early, the whole day they'll be uh, streaming. Uh, yeah, that QR code uh, gives you the, the URL of the NASA stream for this. Um, a lot of educational activities beforehand, local culture activities, and then, of course, they will show you as best they can the excitement of totality from the site where they are. So that is the next best thing. Okay, let me pause here and ask what questions you have on viewing the eclipse, and we're going to go on with the rest of what I want to talk about. But first, for seeing it, for getting there, whatever. This is your chance to ask whatever you want. Yes, sir. What's your plan for clouds? Ah, what's my plan for clouds? Okay, the best plan for clouds, which I did not do this time, but you know, real serious eclipse cases will have mapped out two or three different places to go that are, you know, hundreds of miles apart from each other. And I thought about doing that. You know, this one place I was pointed out, another one near Indy, another one way down like near Carbondale, uh, and then you look at the weather reports the day before and decide where to go. Okay, I didn't do that. Uh, I decided to take it to one, one spot. The advanced extended weather forecast right now says it's going to be partly sunny here and where I'm going to be and down in Indy that day. So we're getting really lucky. Okay? Uh, you know, it's an advanced forecast. It could change, but right now it's looking pretty good. But there's another odd thing that's happening and that's just starting to be understood, which is that 
you know, as the eclipse gets, you know, closer and closer to totality, it's going to get cold. You'll probably, you'll feel the temperature drop probably a good 10 degrees. So by the way, you know, have that sweater at hand so you don't go looking for it. Um, and the thinking is that, you know, as it gets colder, evaporation slows down. So there's less moisture making the clouds. And the clouds tend to dissipate at the moment of totality. I've actually seen this happen. This happened to me last time in Tennessee. There was some partial clouds there, and one was right there near the side. I'm like, God, this is going to kill it. And it just went away just before totality. And people from everywhere are reporting having seen this. So if it's cloudy, especially if we get you know, scattered clouds, you know, the cumulus clouds, just stick with it because there's a really good chance the cloud just may part for you. Um, you know. And if it doesn't, well, it's still going to get really dark. And you know, at least you tried. You won't be kicking yourself for having given up on it. So, Great question. Yes, sir. What's the approximate width of the path in miles? Is it 120 or 140? Uh, my guess it's probably maybe 100 miles wide, 100 miles wide. something like that. Yeah. But you want to get within like 10 miles of that central blue line, really, because being near the edge of it, it's not, not worth it. <laughs> yeah. 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 We're going to Cleveland. Is yeah. There any kind of special thing you should do in a big city uh, during the cliff? I know you probably won't hear it on the Well, the thing is, uh, and I haven't looked carefully at Cleveland, but, but check out one of these maps and just get to where you're close to that center line. That's the absolute main thing. Uh, of course, if I was there, I might be tempted to go to the Indians game that day because they're having <laughs> eclipse at the ballpark and delaying first pitch because of that. <laughs> You know, and when else could you do that? Okay, I'm a big baseball fan. <laughs> um, you know, and that's up to you. If you like to be among big crowds and party people, then go to one of the big parties. You know, if you'd rather just, you know, have a quiet time yourself than find someplace different that's farther away. You know? And then if you're, you know, have friends or relatives there and you want to be at their house, that might be good, it might not be. Just look at how close to center line they are, you know, and then decide accordingly. Anything else? Okay then, <clears throat> let me ask you a question. What if the sun doesn't come back? <laughs> I mean, think about this a minute. You know, if you were a person living thousands of years ago and you had no knowledge of what causes eclipses or even that they could happen like this because one hadn't happened in your village before and then suddenly the sun starts vanishing, that's completely gone. That would be really scary, wouldn't it? I mean, really scary, because you wouldn't know if it's coming, coming back or not. And what would you think? And I want to ask you, especially the young people here, if the sun didn't come back, what are some of the things you would miss? Just throw out some things. I was here, you know, what, what would you miss if the sun didn't come back? Warmth. Warm, yeah, yeah, it would get cold really fast, so I would certainly miss the world. I love being on the sun when it's warm. What else might you miss? I'm sorry, what? Seasonal depression is going to be major. <laughs> yes, major seasonal depression. Worse than living in Alaska, yeah. Um, <laughs> what else? Rainbows. Rainbows, yeah, there would not be any rainbows. You need the sun to make a rainbow, that's for sure. What else? Anything else? Yeah, it would pretty, put it, pretty much put an end to life on Earth, wouldn't it? Because without no, sunlight, no, uh, chlorophyll, no. no chlorophyll, no plants are going to grow. You can't grow food, and flowers won't grow. That would be pretty bad. No sense of time. The what? No sense of time. Oh, yeah, you wouldn't know what time it was. Yeah, yeah, because we rely on the sun. It was a basic timekeeping thing. Yeah. Many things will pass away. Uh, many things will pass, yeah. So, you know, I made a little list, a lot of what you mentioned. Um, I mean, to me, just not seeing the sun will be a big problem. I just like seeing the sun. I love the sun. It won't be there. And, yeah, there won't be flowers because they can't grow without the sunlight. And, yes, it will get really, 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 really cold. All the water will freeze. So you're not having liquid water. You can't grow food, right? Because you need, as you said, you need the sunlight for photosynthesis to grow the food. 
you might think, well, at least maybe we could light, you know, burn some coal or some natural gas, something, get a little warmth and light, or maybe at least it'll be a little gasoline. But actually, without the sun, if you go back in time, we would not have fossil fuels. Because fossil fuels formed, yeah, it was like, you know, millions of years ago. They formed from plant life. The plants, when they die, end up getting buried underground. And after many, many millennia of decomposition, they turn into the oil and natural gas and coal and so forth. Uh, so without the sun to have grown those plants millions of years ago, we wouldn't have any fossil fuels. That doesn't work. This is a little graphic on how the fossil fuels were formed. And that makes us think about energy. Because, you know, we're talking about these days because of what the fossil fuels are doing to our planet. Right? By putting carbon dioxide there, we burn them, which is sort of the carbon dioxide sort of traps heat around the planet. The planet's getting warmer and really making a mess with our climate. Right? We want to use renewable energy. But you can't use solar panels without the sun. <laughs> and what about wind? Well, that doesn't work either. Because why is there wind in the first place? It's the sunlight heating up the ground and then causing natural convection to cause the air to rise. You know, or it's been hot here and it's cold over there and the wind goes from hot to the cold. So without the sun to cause those thermal differences, there's no wind. So the wind turbines don't do us any good. But you know, at Notre Dame, we got around this, right? We built a hydroelectric power plant over at the St. Joe River. How many of you knew that we did that? <laughs> Some of you did. Uh, so you know Sites Park over there where the band shell used to be and now it looks like it's just a big patch of dirt? That's because we at Notre Dame dug it up, installed these big, called run of the river turbines, right? Instead of having a dam, we just put those right in the running water, and the running water turns to place and make electricity from them. And we're now in the process, that they're working now, and we're now in the process of working with the city to build a better sites park on top, so you won't know anything was there. But without the sun, would this work? Well, let's think about that a minute. So we need the water flowing down the river. So how'd the water get up to the uphill end of the river? Yeah, we had had a sunlight to evaporate moisture to make clouds and the rain to fall, because that's how the water gets up to the top of the hill, right? With no sun, no evaporation, no rainfall, and so there won't be any water to run down the river. And besides, the river would be frozen, so we can't do that anyway. Oh, well, try it. Oh, maybe we use nuclear power, nuclear fission, right? We can know how to do that. We have new generations of very safe small nuclear reactors coming online right now as we speak. The prototype stage, that would be great. But, you know, to make nuclear fission work, we need heavy elements like uranium, plutonium. Where do they come from? Well, you know, they weren't made by the sun. They were made in other stars, stars that are much larger, much more massive than the sun. And those stars, at the end of their lifetimes, exploded in a great supernova explosion. And in that explosion, they generated all the heavy elements, like the uranium. And then that stuff just scattered around the galaxy. But guess what? Our sun collected it gravitationally as it pulled itself together and pulled the planets together. So we have the sun to thank for pulling in the uranium. Without that, we couldn't have nuclear fission either. So, tough. And then people say, well, what about nuclear fusion, right? Just get some hydrogen and smash it together to make helium. That will generate a lot of energy. Yes, it will. And there are a lot of news stories about how we're on the verge of making these fusion reactors that will give us infinite energy forever. And that's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Apologies to many of my physicists' friends, but that's a lie. Yes, they have managed to mimic nuclear fusion in the laboratory. It's not easy. You have to confine that hydrogen in a place where the temperature is millions, hundreds of millions of degrees, and hundreds of millions of atmospheric pressure. And if you can do that, then you, you know, it's hard to push them together, because right, you know, protons want to re repel each other. It doesn't work. Uh, and they've managed to do that, and sustain a reaction that for just a fraction of a second. Well, that's good. But to sustain that 24-7, boy, that's a long ways from where we're going now. So that's not going to happen. But you know what? We already have a nuclear fusion reactor. It's called the sun. <laughs> right? 
The sun is mostly hydrogen, and it's just so big and massive that by the force of its own gravity, it squeezes itself together. The central part of it is under those hundreds of millions of pounds of pressure, and the, is at the hundreds of millions of degrees temperature. It's hot enough and enough pressure for fusion to happen easily, and that's in fact what powers the sun, nuclear fusion happening down in the core. And as a fun fact, once all that heat and light and energy is generated way down the center of the sun, it can take like 10,000 or even 100,000 years for it to work its way out to the surface. The sun is so big and so dense, it just takes a long time. But it finally gets out, and when the light finally gets to the photosphere, then it's free to roam and come down to Earth and keep us warm. And that's cool. So, you know, we like having the sun, don't we? So I'm glad the sun is going to come back. I, I can pretty much guarantee that, but you should watch for yourself to be sure. And uh, to wrap this up and summarize it all, I want to introduce you to some other NASA friends of mine. This is, believe it or not, I know you won't believe this. This is a group of singing NASA astrophysicists. <laughs> you didn't know that was possible, did you? <laughs> Well, okay, a couple of them are singing spouses, but most of them are astrophysicists. And they call themselves the Chromatics, and they do a lot of, you know, usual a cappella kinds of gigs around town, but they've also gotten together and did a wonderful educational project for us where they made an entire album of songs about topics in astronomy. And their fun songs are also 100% scientifically accurate, because like I said, they're astrophysicists, and so um, I want to share with you their... Sun Song, which is a great summary of this whole thing. I hope. I saw the sun, it's a big ball of gas, and it's 99% of our solar system's mass. It's an average star in our Milky Way, warming the Earth every day. stare at the sun unless you have official approved eclipse glasses. And uh, yeah, enjoy the sunshine. And I hope you do go out to see that total solar eclipse because it will be worth it. 
So thank you for your attention. Uh, I think we'll have these to hand out to you on your way out. And uh, thanks for being here. Yes, sir. One other question. So yes. You said when it's okay to take your glasses off and look at the sun. Yeah. Are you going to, it's pretty obvious when it's time to put them back on. Yeah. Anytime you can see any of the photosphere, the bright part of the sun, or any of those little beads or diamond rings poking through, it's time to put the glasses back on. Yeah. Thank you for asking that. Yep. Yeah. Okay.